Good evening, and welcome to the annual Gilder Jordan Lecture in Southern Cultural History. My name is Katie McKee, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture here on the campus of the University of Mississippi. But as is true for all things that happen at the center, I am part of a team to whom we owe a debt of public gratitude for tonight's event, most particularly to Afton Thomas, Associate Director for Programs, and to Rebecca Cleary, the center's communications specialist, who made sure you knew how and when to join us for tonight's event. 2021 finds us again on Zoom for the second year in a row. Surely next year, we will be back in Nut Auditorium, settling in around those desks awkwardly attached to the chairs and wishing we'd brought sweaters because it's a little chilly. But tonight, we know you had choices about how to spend your evening, several compelling ones right here on the UM campus, and we appreciate your tuning in. Thank you. The Gilder Jordan Lecture is the result of a long-standing partnership organized through the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. The lecture series, which began in 2010, is designed in partnership with the African American Studies Program, the Center for Civil War Research, and the UM Department of History. It is made possible through the generosity of the Gilder Foundation and honors the late Richard Gilder of New York and his family, as well as University of Mississippi alumni, Dan and Lou Jordan of Virginia. Thank you. This event greatly enriches the intellectual life of our campus community. When the lectures selection committee began discussions about this year's speaker, we thought about how to accomplish several goals. First, we wanted to invite, as we always do, a scholar of the top rank. Second, we hoped to invite a historian who had written and talked about the relationship between their scholarly expertise and our own moment in time. And third, we wanted to hear from someone whose work interlocked with the history and present life of this campus. In her scholarship about Black women of the past and present, and in her work at Rutgers, tonight's speaker, Dr. Deborah Gray White, helped us meet all three of those goals. Dr. White is Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey. She is author of Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South, Too Heavy a Load, Black Women in Defense of Themselves, 1894 to 1994, several K-12 textbooks on United States history, and Let My People Go, African Americans, 1804 to 1860. She holds the Carter G. Woodson Medallion and the Frederick Douglass Medal for Excellence in African American History. So check a distinguished historian of the highest rank. Although immersed in 19th century history and culture, Dr. White underscores in her work the ongoing relevance of scholarship to contemporary issues. In 2008, she published an edited work entitled Telling Histories, Black Women in the Ivory Tower, a collection of personal narratives written by African-American female historians that chronicles the entry of Black women into the historical profession and the development of the field of Black women's history. As a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and as a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, White conducted research for her newest book, Lost in the USA, American Identity from the Promise Keepers to the Million Mom March. So second check a historian whose work overtly connects past to present. But of particular interest to us was the fact that Dr. White currently co-directs the Scarlet and Black Project, which investigates Native Americans and African Americans in the history of Rutgers University. With Professor Marisa Fuentes, she is editor of the 2016 volume, Scarlet and Black, Slavery and Dispossession in Rutgers History. In 2020, she edited Scarlet and Black, Constructing Race and Gender at Rutgers, 1865 to 1945, with Marissa Fuentes and Kendra Boyd. And in 2021, that would be this year, with Fuentes and Mia Carey, she edited the third volume of the Scarlet and Black series, Scarlet and Black, Making Black Lives Matter at Rutgers, 
1945 to 2020. This sustained attention to historical and ongoing intricacies and structural features of campus life was of particular interest to us, given the ways in which individual scholars and groups on this campus are currently engaged in looking directly at the history of this place to remember and to repair. We know that our campus is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Chickasaw Nation. And we know that Barnard Observatory, the home of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture was constructed with enslaved labor. Groups at the University of Mississippi are working to reckon with those facts. Among them, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group, the Interdisciplinary UM Slavery Research Group, is mapping the practice and the legacy of enslavement on campus and in our local community. The Black Power at Ole Miss Task Force, which intentionally foregrounds through its name a collision between calls for change and a romanticized past, is devoted to understanding better how the long reach of the 19th century wraps around a peaceful protest on this campus in 1970 that lands 89 Black students in jail. And finally, as a campus community, we are now walking what we call pathways to equity as we seek to make our campus a more just environment for everyone who studies here and everyone who works here. In hearing from Dr. White about how Rutgers has looked at its past, reacted in the present and planned for the future, we hope to see ourselves more clearly. So check one more time. Please join me in welcoming to tonight's virtual stage, Dr. Deborah Gray White, whose talk is entitled, The Price of the Ticket, Paying for Diversity and Inclusion. I'm really pleased uh, to, to be with you this evening. I really wish I could have come to the campus. I've been uh, at Ole Miss once before. I only know of, uh, you know, in terms of its history, particularly with its history of um, African-Americans, uh, you know, uh, James Meredith historic um, integration of the University of Mississippi. I have to say that uh, as I got older and um, I watched football games on television, I have to say I was just absolutely astounded when I saw everybody um, applauding and cheering on the, uh, the football team, which by you know, the 1990s had African-American players, et cetera. Um, and there's still more work to do as I hear, I'm hearing at uh, Mississippi uh, and I'm hearing, and I know that there's work to do at Rutgers. So the title of my talk is, um, the price of the ticket, paying for diversity and inclusion. Um, it was James Baldwin who coined that phrase, the price of the ticket in their essays. And, and he basically talks about in, in uh, a collection of essays, you know, what both black and white people are paying not only for the racism in America's past, but the racism in its present and hopefully not in his future, but to um, move beyond it, there's a price to be paid, just as we have been paying a price since the very beginning of America, the American nation. So let me begin. In May of 2016, President Obama came to Rutgers to deliver the commencement address, which also happened to be the 250th anniversary address of the university's founding. On that crisp sunny day, Obama described Rutgers as a quote, intellectual melting pot where ideas and cultures flow together among what might just be America's most diverse student body, unquote. Quoting further, he said, America converges here. And in so many ways, the history of Rutgers mirrors the evolution of America, the course by which we became bigger, stronger, and richer, and more dynamic, and a more inclusive nation. 
Obama's depiction of Rutgers as a multicultural, ethnically diverse powerhouse is the way Rutgers boosters like to think about their university. In fact, Rutgers website uses the US News and World Report and the Best Value College's assessment of Rutgers Newark as the most diverse school in the nation as a recruitment tool to attract students. In other words, Rutgers takes its diversity to the bank. It attracts students with its diversity. But it wasn't always this way. Listen to Vicki Donaldson's depiction of what Newark's campus was like in 1967 when she arrived on this white campus that was walled off by a fence to separate it from the predominantly black neighborhood of Newark that surrounded it. Quote, when I came onto the campus, all the walls were white, all the faculty was white, all the students were white. And sometime during that two weeks, uh, I ran into at least one other black person who was part of the kitchen staff. She was there for freshman orientation. And then about two weeks in, I was walking across the campus and I saw a skinny brown man. It happened to be Richard Roper. And he was the first person that I had seen who was black. It was that stark. These words were spoken in 2019 by Vicki Donaldson one of the quote unquote liberators who occupied Conklin Hall in 1969, a black student occupation that marked the beginning of Rutgers journey towards diversity. The skinny brown man who she spied, Richard Roper, was president of the campus chapter of the NEACP. His recollection of the beginning confirmed Donaldson's. According to Roper, 1967 was the year when black students at Rutgers Newark organized a sit-in that ulti ultimately sparked change at Rutgers. Said Roper, we were ready to move and to make a big noise in the process. And move they did. They created the black organization of students, took over Conklin Hall and made demands on the administration. Actions like these were repeated on the Rutgers New Brunswick and Camden campuses. Black students with the support of white and Puerto Rican students made deliberate and intentional efforts to change the culture, the curriculum, the student population, the faculty and administration. They did so knowing that it came at a price. They risked being expelled. They risked going to jail. They risked assault by the police. Some lost their scholarships. Some were disowned by parents and relatives who did not endorse their revolutionary stance. But they understood that change came at a price, that it was not free. Indeed, there's been a lot of change at Rutgers. But in 2015, fully 46 years later, Many black students thought there was more to do. Walking across campus, they saw students, they saw statues of Dutch founders, the people who they knew nothing about, except for Paul Robeson, a black activist who, who Rutgers only reluctantly embraced. There was little evidence that black people had contributed anything to the college or to New Jersey for that matter. These students, and let me repeat that, students enlisted the New Brunswick Chancellor to do what many colonial colleges were doing. We call them colonial colleges because they were um, Rutgers like Harvard and Yale and Princeton, uh, Columbia. They were created during the um, colonial era. What they were doing was exploring their university's history with slavery and also slavery's legacy. It was their belief, these students believed, that understanding the past would help them and the university go forward. They believed 
as I do. That recalling, recounting, and remembering are part of the process of reparations. Yeah, I said that nasty word, reparations. It's the price of the ticket, a ticket to a more inclusive, a more fruitful and rewarding future for the university. I wanna begin this talk by sharing some of our findings. And then I'll talk a bit about the nuts and bolts of the Scarlet and Black Project and end with a few remarks about where Rutgers is today. Um, by the way, Scarlet and Black are the colors that Rutgers uses to represent itself to the nation and the world. Here with this project, we use the colors to signify something else. The blood that was spilled on the banks of the Raritan River by those dispossessed of their land and the bodies that labored unrecompensed uh, so that Rutgers could be built and sustained. What we found, it's no secret that Rutgers founders were slave owners, though that fact comes as a surprise to many New Jerseyans who believe that slavery was only a Southern phenomenon. For example, in September, 1749, the slave ship Wolf left New York City for Africa where it would troll the West Coast eventually buying and imprisoning 147 Africans, most of whom were children. Before it returned to New York in May, 1751, with its human cargo packed like sardines in its hole, it had littered the Atlantic Ocean with 81 dead black bodies. Again, most of them children. They had succumbed to the vessel's diseased environment, particularly the conditions that allowed 12 to 13 inch worms to incubate the stomachs and intestines of its youthful captives. On May 21st, the surviving 66 were auctioned off for sale by Philip Livingston, the Wolf's principal investor slash slave trader merchant. 17 years later, Livingston became a founder of Queens College, the school that would eventually be renamed for another son of a slave owning family, Henry Rutgers. The first president of the college, Jacob Hardenberg, and its first tutor, Frederick Freelingheisen, were also slaveholders. In fact, Jacob Hardenberg's family owned Bonfrey and Mama Bet, the parents of Sojourner Truth, the noted abolitionist and women's rights advocate. James Hardenberg, his immediate relative, inherited the two and he housed them along with his other slaves in the basement of a hotel where they slept on mud and board floors with minimum straw and blankets. Though as slaves they worked for free, Hardenberg, like other slaveholders of the late 18th century, required that they provide for their own sustenance, meaning they had to feed themselves, which proved to be an additional hardship, particularly for the elderly. When Charles Hardenberg died, none of his heirs wanted to care for Truth's parents, so her mother was free, not as a show of benevolence, but as a way of forcing her to solely assume the care of her husband. Bet died shortly after her emancipation and Bomfrey was left to fend for himself. But having no way to get his own food or properly shelter himself, he died alone in a cabin from cold and starvation. Around the same time that Truth's parents were being abandoned to die, which is around the turn of the 19th century. A hired out slave belonging to a New Brunswick physician was employed to help lay the foundation for Old Queens. A full 80 years. I hear uh, is a ledger showing something that our um, 
researchers found. So Jacob Dunham, who was the physician, was paid for his slaves' labor. And uh, this is how much he was paid. All right. Um, 80 years later, 80 years had passed before the first African-American was allowed to matriculate at Rutgers. Now, we don't skip just from Will to Carr, but we tell the story of race making at Rutgers, how Rutgers administrators through their leadership of the American Colonization Society advocated for sending free blacks back to Africa rather than letting them stay and become citizens. How essay contests perpetuated ideas about black inferiority. How students and faculty through their speeches and study groups helped establish the ideological and intellectual foundation for slavery and the separation of the races and how they disseminated their ideas around the nation and the world. All of this is in volumes one and two. Recently, Carr was memorialized at Rutgers by having a library named for him. But Islay Walden and Edward Lawson's story had been lost at least until the Scarlet and Black Project. Uh, North Carolina ex-slave Walden, who was nearly blind, walked first to Washington DC and then to New Jersey and sustained himself by selling his poetry. He found a New Jersey benefactor who paid his tuition at Howard. He was allowed to matriculate at the New Brunswick Theological Seminary, which is Rutgers sister affiliate, which shared land and faculty with Rutgers College only because they expected him to return to North Carolina to work among his own people. They explicitly said he can't stay in, in, in New Brunswick. In fact, when a Yale article reported that Walden had been admitted to, to, to the seminary, the Targum Rutgers newspaper rebuked Yale for its quote, tasteless and disparaging reporting that had sullied Rutgers reputation, you know, it had sullied uh, Rutgers reputation because they had reported that there was a black guy at the seminary. Edward Lawson, Edward Lawson would have been the second African American to graduate from Rutgers College proper, but for the fact that after three years of stellar academic performance and comportment, he was dismissed on the questionable word of a white janitor who accused him of stealing mail from Wine and Soul dormitory. Though the janitor had a history of hating blacks, he pre and presented no evidence to support his accusation, Rutgers just dismissed Lawson seven months shy of his graduation. Lawson maintained his innocence and thereafter represented himself as a Rutgers man, told everybody I went to Rutgers, even though he was forced to graduate from Howard. He subsequently sent his son, Edward Lawson Jr. to Rutgers and Edward Lawson Jr. became the fifth African-American to graduate from Rutgers. Of course, more people are familiar with Paul Robeson who graduated from Rutgers as a Phi Beta Kappa, Kappa and Skull, All-American in multiple in months. This despite the fact that he was beat up by his football teammates during his first practices, that football teams like William and Mary and Georgia Tech refused to play Rutgers if he played, that crowds shouted the N-word when he took the field, and that opponents threatened to cut his heart out when he was on the field with, with them, when he was on the field with them. This worldwide celebrated baritone was not allowed to travel with the Glee Club. And even though he was allowed to sing at home concert, at home concerts, because they wouldn't allow him to travel, he could not attend post-concert social functions. When he won first prize at the freshman oratorical contest at Rutgers, newspapers 
celebrated the white second place prize winner, making mention of Robeson and the last lines of their articles. Moving on with some of the highlights um, of the things we found. In 1934, 15 years after Robeson graduated from Rutgers College, the College of New Jersey, which later became uh, Douglas College, uh, Douglas College was the, the, the women's college at Rutgers, Douglas College made a mistake. They sent Julia Baxter an admittance letter. Unbeknownst to them, Baxter, whose picture was sent with her application, was Black. They thought she was white. When she arrived for an interview and the mistake became obvious, they tried to dissuade her from coming. Baxter was ushered out of the room while administrators tried to convince her father, who was a founder and leader of a, of a um, New Jersey chapter of the NAACP, you know, that she would be better off at what they said was, uh, she'd be better off at a quote unquote, Negro college. Neither Julia or her father agreed. She attended Douglas and graduated with honors, even though she was not allowed to live in the dormitories for fear that her morals were not up to standard and that black male visitors, if she had any, would taint the image of the white Douglas women. Rutgers made more than one mistake identifying African-Americans, probably several, but it was left to historians to do the sleuthing. A year before Baxter was admitted, Archibald Dunlap graduated from Rutgers. Dunlap self-identified as white. What gave it away? His senior yearbook photo carried the caption Alma Mammy, suggesting that his fellow classmates suspected his black heritage. And although Veronica Henriksen hailed from a self-identified black family, she spent her years at Douglas as a white commuter from Plainfield. It, this is uh, Veronica Henriksen, right? Henriksen and Dunlap were among the handful of Blacks who attended Rutgers and Douglas College before the baby boomer generation or the desegregation generation pushed push the doors of Rutgers open for good. Volume three of Scarlet and Black, of the Scarlet and Black Project covers the student occupation of Conklin Hall, the evolution of the African-American studies program at Rutgers and the EOP program. In many ways, volume two and three speak to the legacy of slavery, what had to be undone and redone in order to change and remake Rutgers. Um, I would say that one of the things that uh, we, we also found we went through all of the yearbooks and some of the caricatures of black people, some of the photographs. We also found a, um, in, in New Brunswick proper, a, um, um, I guess we, we found the, the New Brunswick Rutgers clan uh, and we have pictures of their, their meetings. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we cover, but we also, um, go all the way up to 19, um, we, we go to the, to the present and we cover the remarks in 1994 uh, that was made by um, President Lawrence who said, um, who called black Americans a disadvantaged population. He said that we did not have the genetic her hereditary background to do well on the SATs. This is in 1994. And we also cover um, Imus's, Don Imus's remarks, wherein he characterized the Rutgers women's basketball team as rough, 
before calling them nappy headed hoes. In covering this, the Scarlet and Black project comes full circle back around to remarks made by some of the founding fathers of the university, most notably Theodor Frelinghuysen. In 1850, when he was vice president of the American Colonization Society, he testified that, quote, Blacks were a, uh, a, a depraved and separate race who were licentious, ignorant, and irritated. In pointing out the similarities between the remarks of Frelinghuysen and Lawrence, we don't maintain that things had not changed at Rutgers, but we do show how some ideas don't change and how negativity about African-Americans can still impact university policy. And now I'm just gonna switch gears for a minute and, and um, talk about the nuts and bolts of the project. How do we do it? Um, how did we research, write and disseminate our knowledge, produce three edited books in the space of about four and a half years? Any of you who are, who are academics, you know that it can take four and a half years just to get a publisher to, uh, to, to publish your book, even when it's already written. Um, so it was really something that we were able to do this. Uh, this project got started in 2015, the very end of 2015. So as I noted before, when I talked about President Obama coming to deliver the 250th anniversary uh, address. 2016 marked the 250th anniversary of the founding of Rutgers University. And after that meeting that Chancellor Richard Edwards had with African American students who told him about their feelings of alienation on campus, the Chancellor formed the committee that had the unwieldy title, quote, the Committee on the Enslaved and Disfranchised disenfranchised population in Rutgers history. Mind you, the committee was formed and announced before they had a chair. So while walking my dog, I got a call from the chancellor and he asked me if I would chair the committee. As I said to some graduate students this morning, always take your time in saying yes to anything. And I did. Uh, but I said, uh, I, I gave it at least two days, and I said that I would, um, I would do this. And I'd like to say that there was a lot of planning that went into this project. And to be honest, there was more resolve and just dogged determination than endless planning. I mean, we just really didn't have an awful lot of time because they wanted a book in a year. Composed of administrators from different areas of the university, and undergraduates and graduate representatives, this committee would have been meeting today on how to accomplish our goal of uncovering this history. Uh, not the least of the issues was the fact that everyone who had been excluded from Rutgers history wanted to get in on this. They wanted their history told. And I, that's not a bad thing, but it's a rather impossible thing to do with just one project. Moreover, this history, and particularly for the first volume, is very difficult and time consuming because you know, 16th and 17th century historical sources are all handwritten, there's nothing typed, and they're all in Old English. But I even give it a mandate. And it was, <laughs> it was truly mission impossible. It was not put in these exact words, but it truly was like, you know, the mission impossible of the movies. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to research, write, edit, and publish a book before the end of next year, 2016. If you accept this job, you will present your initial findings at a public forum in November and have the first volume ready to distribute at that time. Now, Rutgers had the press. 
we had to provide the manuscript. There was no tape that was gonna self-destruct like in the movies. No one promised to disavow me or these instructions, but I knew that this was, um, this was a job of colossal proportions. How did we go about it? The time constraint actually worked in our favor. We had a deadline and we were going to meet it. Remarkably, remarkably, there was no arguing, there were no disputes, everybody just pulled together. You know, I met with this unwieldy committee on enslaved and disenfranchised populations in Rutgers history, but I also created a subcommittee of experts, archivists, librarians, graduate students, and fellow professors. And I will say that the graduate students were were experts in researching. Not all of our graduate students were, did African-American history. They were not all Americanists. They just knew how to research. Okay, a team of graduate students from the history department. We also had, um, a, in this first volume, we had a graduate student who volunteered from the, the sociology department. And as we did uh, volumes two and three, we had graduate students from all kind, from all over the university. People just showed up, said, what can we do? They worked closely with my colleague and co-editor, Professor Mar Marissa Fuentes, the department's colonialist, Professor Camilla Townsend, the department's Native American specialist, and Thomas Bruciano, the university's archivist, um, were also just absolutely incredibly helpful. Because of the connection between the Dutch Reformed Church and the founding of Rutgers, we also work closely with the librarians at the Sage Library of the New Brunswick Theological Seminary. Our folks, uh, particularly our grad students, divided into three subgroups or several subgroups actually. One group worked on the trustees and founders of Rutgers and they located the wills and inventories that indicated who owned slaves. Uh, we have the names of some of the enslaved who built old queens and how much their masters were paid. There, there are a number of other details, but the bottom line is that by the summer of 2016, we had enough to write a book of essays about the slave ownership of Rutgers founding fathers and also about the New Brunswick community that surrounded it, about the African-Americans in that New Brunswick community. From the wills, we discern how the university founders bequeath the human beings they owned. Another group of researchers unpacked what the New Brunswick African-American community looked like. We have the minutes, the university does, um, of the African-American Association that met in New Brunswick. We know that its members were both enslaved and free and that masters of the enslaved paid their slave membership dues to belong, belong to this African-American association. Uh, these minutes help reveal the social and political life of New Brunswick's black population. This is for the first um, volume and in subsequent volumes, we made sure that we research the black community of New Brunswick, and then of course of Newark and then of Camden. The final group of researchers worked on the founders' thoughts about slavery. On the Native American front, Professor Townsend's undergraduate seminar worked on the Lenape people. By the, found, by the founding of the university, the Lenape had already lost possession of the land that Rutgers is built upon. But the students nevertheless researched and wrote papers on, among other things, the social and cultural lives of the Lenape people, the displacement of Native Americans in the New Brunswick area during the 17th century, their participation in the debate over Indian removal that took place in the 1820s and 30s, and the way New Brunswick area residents romanticized Native Americans. Professor Townsend wrote the article, and as you will see in volume one, credit was given. Every name of the undergraduates uh, who worked on the book is listed. Uh, we gave credit to those undergraduates who did the research. A graduate student tracked down information about 
how Indian lands out west got transferred to Rutgers with the Morrill Land Grant Acts of the 1860s. Rutgers is a land grant school. And it was only at our final meeting when we were trying to figure out what to name the book of essays did we choose the name of the project and the title of the books, Scarlet and Black? We more or less recreated the same structure for volumes two and three. We divided into groups. One handled the people directly associated with Rutgers, including administrators, faculty, and students. Um, of course, as the century, 19th century, and then uh, uh, forget it, the 20th century, grew on, move, uh, grew as, as, as Rutgers grew as time passed, okay? Uh, and there was just more to cover by the time we got to this third group. Rutgers had expanded to three full uh, colleges um, in New Jersey. But we always managed to focus on the intellectual milieu, the curriculums that were covered, the essay contest that the university held, the racial climate that was fostered. We focused on the community, both black and white, um, that surrounded the university, first New Brunswick, and then Newark and Camden. And whenever we could, whenever we could, we enlisted undergraduates, undergraduates, as some of our researchers. As noted, the undergraduates did the work on the Lenape people, and the third volume has two essays authored by undergraduates. As a result of our research, unnamed buildings were named in remembrance of African-Americans and plaques were placed around the campus explaining the connection that various white founders of Rutgers had to slavery. In October of 2019, the university named its newest dormitory complex the Sojourner Truth Apartments. And it named the entry walkway to Old Queens, the first building at Rutgers, which currently houses the president and chancellor's office, Will's Way, after the enslaved person who we found um, helped lay the foundation for this building. The public presentation of our work on campus and in the New Brunswick community um, we've given several presentations uh, at the library, at churches, et cetera. Um, and the dedication of these, uh, the dedication ceremonies of these two landmarks have helped Rutgers begin the process of acknowledging its history and reconciling with it. Along with the books, we've integrated the new knowledge into Rutgers visitors tours and our undergraduates in our public history course have developed a separate tour for school and community groups that want to delve more deeply into this history. We are near completion of a website that will be updated continuously um, as will all of our tours. In concluding, I have two important points to make. The first is that this project was undertaken with the full, and I mean full financial support of the university. For the last four and a half years, we have supported graduate student research and writing at the cost of $20 per hour. Since this wasn't my personal research project and I just did not, I could not write a grant proposal. This is one way to finance it, but um, my feeling was that if the university really wanted this history, then they would have to pay for it. Um, obviously, this financial support was critical because it gave our researchers incentive. Another incentive for our graduate students was the published pieces that they could and have taken on the job market. The experience of writing and editing a published piece was invaluable to them. Once the project started to mushroom, it was obvious that Professor Fuentes and I needed help. We institutionalized it by housing it in the Rutgers Center for Historical Analysis. The university provided postdoc associates to do a lot of the administrative work. Our first two postdocs, Kendra Boyd and Maya Carey 
who were um, researchers, they were Rutgers graduate students for volume one and Maya Carey for volume two, they became co-editors of volume two and three. So they also, in addition to having articles, they have edited books under, uh, on their CV. Both of them are now assistant professors. Another postdoc, Alexandria Russell, is now working at Harvard, helping them on their slavery project. I can't help but snigger at that one. In short, I cannot understate how important the financial support, which was upwards towards a million dollars, has been. Um, Marisa and I, when we when we added it all up, we kept saying, shh, 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 you know, let's not tell them, but I'm sure that they figured it out and they were um, uh, keeping notes on how much this was costing. Lastly, or the second thing I, I wanna conclude with is that we included a list of recommendations at the end of volume one of Scarlet and Black. And many of the recommendations have been implemented or are in the process of being implemented, including uh, we wanted the publication of a more complete history of African-Americans at Rutgers. And they said, sure, all right, you can do that. Um, you can do volumes two and three. And trust me, if we wanted to keep doing it, they would probably endorse that. We don't want to do that. Um, we had wanted the establishment of physical and virtual tours. And they said, let's do it. And we had to hire all of the IT people that was necessary to, uh, to do this, um, as well as uh, people to help us create a digital tour. We have um, an app that anybody can go on and, and take the tour by themselves. Uh, we wanted the establishment of retention scholarships for some of our disadvantaged students. That has been instituted. We wanted the uh, appointment of postdocs um, to help us with the project. They said, sure. Um, we uh, met members of the Native American community wanted Rutgers to underwrite the Native American Folk, Folk Festival in New Jersey. That is done and being done. Uh, plus we wanted we have loads of buildings at Rutgers that have no name or, or silly names. Um, you know, like administrative building number one, et cetera. And um, these are now being renamed for people who are important to um, African-Americans and other people of color. One of the most important recommendations that has not been implemented is the creation of a diversity course requirement. Uh, we do, however, have a new center, the Institute for the Center for the Study of Global Racial Justice. We also have a new $45 million initiative that's just been announced, the aim of which is to diversify the faculty by providing for academic lines and more visiting professors and postdocs, et cetera. Overall, I am really pleased with how this project has progressed. I, in 2000, late 2015, could not have imagined that it would have been this successful. We accomplished our aims because the administration was willing to provide all the support needed to complete this project, no questions asked. My department and colleagues were equally supportive and encouraging. Uh, I encountered no opposition. If anything, I was the one who initially had doubts. The university was and is committed to the project, and that has been a key to its success. Leadership comes from the top, and both past and present leadership gave us their total support. Last year, we saw leadership at the very top change, and boy, I could not have been more pleased. The future really looks bright. In 2020, Dr. Francine Conway came on board to head the new Brunswick campus. And Dr. Antonio Tillis came on to head the Camden campus. And Dr. Jonathan Holloway, a historian of African America, 
was appointed president of Rutgers University. Things are really looking up at Rutgers and I'm pleased to have been a part of it. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Um, I don't know if you can hear the applause from Mississippi up to New Jersey, but I think that, uh, there is a warm feeling headed your way for sure. We really appreciate that. And I, um, like a good moderator, had thought that I would get to ask the first question, but in fact, there are so many already piling up that I am gonna ask those instead. Um, and I'll save mine. So the first question, um, comes from Noel Wilson, who asks, as an outgrowth of this project, is there, an is there an initiative to recruit Native American students to Rutgers? Um, you know, I can't really speak for other departments, but I do know that as an outcome of this project, uh, we certainly, I mean, in the history department, um, we have increased our um, uh, efforts to recruit Native Americans. And across the university with this new $45 million um, initiative, uh, I can only say that Native Americans, I mean, I say I'm not an administrator, okay? I really am not. So, but I can only suspect that um, there, there will be because uh, I do know that what's gonna happen with this new initiative is that we, um, we're going to do cluster hires. And I think everything is going to be made possible to recruit Native Americans uh, along with other, other uh, disadvantaged, dispossessed and people of color. So, um, and, and we also have a new vice president for diversity and inclusion. And so my sense is yes, I can just say that. Um, a lot of the language that you're using, the terminology that you're using is all familiar to us, although we uh, sometimes hear it deployed in ways a little differently from the ways that you have introduced some of this language. Um, so we have to ask this question that comes from Julian McClure. What kinds of resistance to the Scarlet and Black Project did you encounter from within the university or from community members and alumni? Well, as I said, um, Resistance, I didn't encounter any resistance. Now that is not to say that there was no resistance. Um, the people who I went to for money, which went all the way up to the chancellor at the time, the chancellor was uh, Richard Edwards. And, you know, I just asked um, for this and that and this and that. I will say this though, um, there has been resistance from many of the families of the founders, you know, the descendants of the founders who, you know, they, they've just, um, and particularly I can just say the Freelingheisen family um, wrote and protested, et cetera, because they, they they didn't really want us to um, to talk about uh, to, about the Freeling Eisens um, in the way that we were were doing it, and um, so I I will I, I can say that I know that from outside of the university, there's probably a lot of mm -hmm. resistance when we dedicated Will's Way and when we dedicated the. Um, um, the, the Sojourn of Truth Apartments. Uh, I asked the campus police for more security. They hadn't even thought that there was gonna be any needed. And I'm just like, oh no, I don't, I'm not gonna stand up there and, and talk about this uh, unless I know that you've um, blocked off the streets, et cetera. So it's not like I wasn't aware that there would be resistance. I will say that I was able to work on this project pretty much resistance free. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say that uh, Rutgers is such a liberal place, you know, an accepting place. I'm only going to say that, um, and, and actually I will say this in some of the classes 
like we have um, the Rutgers public history class for undergraduates. I know that the, one of our professors she met some people in that class who um, protested having to do, you know, doing the plaques, but that's part of public history. And, you know, in the end, um, she, she, they wound up doing the plaques. And so um, I, I, I can say that uh, I got in and out without having to experience an awful lot of resistance, even though I know it's out there. I'm gonna keep us moving because the questions are really piling up, but I feel like I'd like to get a drink with you sometime and talk some more. <laughs> um, Adam Gusso asks this question. You began your talk by speaking about Rutgers Newark founded in 1908 and spoke at length about the founding and founders of Rutgers New Brunswick founded 17. 66. You also mentioned a third campus, Rutgers Camden, founded in the 1920s. What sort of racial dynamics were at work when those two later campuses were founded in the first and third decades of the 20th century? Okay. Um, I'm not sure that those that I mentioned the dates of Newark. I may be um, uh, a Newark and Camden. They were founded, I think, a little later than 1908, or at least some of the, what happened with both Newark, Newark is a sort of a conglomeration of several schools that sort of came together and then they put them together and all of a sudden they became Rutgers Newark. Um, Rutgers Newark has an incredible history because Newark, Newark is a, is a predominantly black city and yet, the university was predominantly white. There was almost no one, uh, very, very, very few African-Americans uh, either in the law school that came to make up um, Newark. Um, so, and the same thing one could say with Camden. I mean, the city of Camden has an interesting, very interesting um, history in that, you know, after World War II, there was white flight. People left the city of Camden as many of the manufacturing uh, companies there either shut down or relocated to the suburbs. So in both Camden and in Newark, which are a lot larger than New Brunswick, uh, the city itself was predominantly black but people would come in from the suburbs uh, and go to Rutgers Camden and go to Rutgers Newark. And the black people who were living in Camden were, they were, they were caught in just a, a downward spiral of white flight and deindustrialization because they didn't leave. So both with Camden and Newark, their desegregation or integration or road towards diversity and inclusion were a lot more um, violent and a lot more um, uh, combustible than one could say about New Brunswick. It's not to say that you know, New Brunswick was was um, turbulent free, but in terms of turbulence, Newark was incredible, was incredibly, um, well, uh, uh, fractious. And you actually had white people demonstrating when, when Conklin Hall, when black students seized uh, Conklin Hall, uh, white students protested against it. And one of the things you'll find in chat in the, in the third volume, that the letters that were written to Mason Gross were horrible. They they threatened to 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 do harm, physical harm to Mason Gross just because he actually entertained the notion that maybe there was there was something to the protest, and that he actually sat down and negotiated with these students, and um, most whites at Newark um, um, just disagreed. And so, uh, but Mason Gross, one has to applaud his perseverance there because 
he insisted that, you know, well, we are part of the state university and he did negotiate and um, beginning with um, 1969 or after 1969, the EOF program um, uh, brought in more uh, black and brown students. Um, so I guess my, that's a sort of a long answer, but the, sh the, the short answer is that Camden and Newark had um, a much more turbulent time moving towards diversity and inclusion. And you would not know it today. I mean, that, that and today you walk across Newark, I'm very seldom down at Camden's campus, but Camden is in, in South Jersey. Newark is a little further north of New Brunswick, but you walk across the campus and it's absolutely amazing um, to see the difference. But I would say that, um, as I, I, as I said in the talk, Newark's campus was walled off by a fence to separate the white campus from the black community surrounding it. And they got, um, they got rid of that fence pretty quickly. We're not gonna keep you here all night, but uh, we're gonna see if we can get a few more questions in here. And in the interest of doing that, I'm gonna start looping some of the questions together question askers and maybe not reading your whole thing, but I'm trying to get everything done here. So um, we have a question from Robin about um, donor reactions to this project. And then a question from Laura about alumni responses mm -hmm. to the project. So maybe we could talk about those two things. You, you touched on this earlier, but maybe those two things in concert. Um, again, as, I am not aware that, that, that it's been incredibly negative. In fact, I think it's been relatively positive. And I think a lot of this has to do with the timing. So when volume one was rolled out and when we did the November, now remember the date, November, 2016, which was the public presentation of volume one. It was um, maybe three or four days after Donald Trump had won the election. And New Jersey uh, is a blue state. And even not to say that we don't have conservatives and Republicans, but there, um, there was a real outpouring of dissent against um, the election of Donald Trump. And the only thing that Rutgers could, could, could offer, you know, when people say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, we had the presentation of volume one. I have never seen, we had over a thousand people show up for the presentation of volume one. We had our multi-purpose room with seats at least 800 people. And then we had two or three overflow rooms. So I'm thinking that um, the, the protest on campus against Donald Trump's election really coincided with the rollout of Scarlet and Black. Now, volume two was released in um, March of 2020. And right, um, so it's it's in May, it's uh, sure, I, you know, I, I, I can't remember all of these days, but almost in tandem with the killing of George Floyd. And then uh, one of the things that uh, we had already started with volume three, but because all of the, um, all of the archives were shut down. My feeling was, okay, folks, we're going, since we can't go into the archives and you can't do your own personal research, we're gonna finish up volume three so that when this COVID is over, you can go back to your own work. So remarkably, um, volume three came out this year. So in the middle of a pandemic, but also um, in the aftermath of, demonstrations against police brutality. Um, so I, I really do believe that, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that there 
is a lot of dissent out there, but at the same time, I think there's more support than dissent. We also got Dr. Jonathan Holloway and he took office January of 2020. He is enormously popular. He's also very popular with the state legislature. And to tell you the truth, whenever the university has any, you know, whenever they need to respond with, so what are you doing about diversity? What are you doing about inclusion? Um, what are you doing in this and this and this? What do they say? Well, let's see, we started with the Scarlet and Black Project and that was something that Marisa and I noticed. It's like, okay, so we're getting incredibly good publicity here because the university is talking us up because we are the one tangible product. Uh, we have a product that says we are enlisting our students to be learning about um, African-Americans and people of color. And we're researching our history and we're going to be doing something about it. And um, that's the way that I have received this. Um, and remember, I'm not an administrator, so I'm fairly fortunate in that regard. I'm a faculty member and I claim that faculty membership. Uh, so when, when people say to me this, I, I, will, I will say, well, I think we need to talk to Dr. Holloway. Well, related, we have uh, a, a question or two about the funding for the project. Did was there, um, you know, a targeted fundraising campaign? Was um, where did it where did it come from? Where did it come from? Um, I went to the chancellor and I said, the the chancellor Richard Edwards, I said, if you really want a book, and he really did because it was the 250th anniversary of Rutgers founding and no one had said a thing about African-Americans in the history. And he said, I wanted this book. And I said, it's gonna cost you. And um, every time I needed money and I needed support, I went to the administration and trust me, it kept coming. And I know that may sound, and actually whenever I say this at any forum, where there are people who are doing this pro projects like this, they're, they're, they are like incredulous, oh no, oh no. And it's true that I, I we, whenever we, we, when we said, oh, we can't keep doing, we meaning me and Marisa, we can't do timesheets and we can't keep track. So yeah, they, they gave a lot of that to the, um, to the department administrators, but in the end, Finally, we needed somebody to take care of that. And we, when we asked for help and we asked for postdocs, they gave it to us. We asked for FTEs, full-time employees, particularly people to help with the, um, the, digital, the digital stuff. And they said, sure. So right now we have a full-time digital person who's an FTE. He's been working with us for three years. Um, keep, keep staying in the same vein, um, Don Cole asks, um, is there on record um, a formal apology from the administration for um, past missteps? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Um, I don't know that students have demanded that. There have been some demands from students to change the names of buildings. Uh, on the Camden campus, just recently, a statue of Walt Whitman was taken down and just placed in a quieter area, uh, sort of an out of the way place. Walt Whitman having been the racist that he was, um, the students said uh, his place is not in front of the campus center. And so they moved it. Um, as I said, um, the car library, it used to be called the, the, Kilmer, the Kilmer Library. Kilmer is just the sort of the name of the street in the area that um, this library, they just changed it and renamed it Kilmer. Uh, renamed it after um, uh, a car, James Dixon car. So 
the students, and, and I really do think that a lot of this has to come from students, right? Uh, as a faculty member, you know, I can only do so much. I can do this research and my feeling is, uh, we've done the research now here. I'm giving it to you, the students. Now you take it and you do what you think you need to do with it. If the students were to go to uh, uh, President Holloway, perhaps they might, some things might or may not change. You know, he was at Yale, he was the Dean of Yale College when um, he was confronted with students who wanted him to take, uh, to change the name of uh, uh, Calhoun College after John C. Calhoun. Um, and I can't, I remember, I think they did eventually change it. And, but uh, initially he opposed it. So I, I'm, I'm as a faculty member who for the last four and a half years has done this kind of work, I'm willing to work with others to continue to put this research out. Um, but I'm willing to pass the buck to the administrators who I think uh, they now, and to students, because I really think it's in the students' hands to do what they will with the research that we have handed them. And if I support them, then I'll support them, but I wanna see them take the initiative now. It seems like you're <laughs> describing a process in which there's a role for all kinds of people, faculty, yeah. students, yeah. undergraduate students, Students, graduate students, administrators at various levels. Yeah. So you've, you've given us um, a lot to think about. We really appreciate your being here. It's about 645 and that is our uh, estimated time to end. But I cannot thank you enough for joining us virtually. I really hope that you will come to Oxford and we'll have a chance to continue some of these conversations and tell you about strides that we have made on our own campus. So, and I'm really sorry that I was not able to be there in person. I was really looking forward to it. Well, uh, normally we would be taking you out for dinner next. So go make yourself a sandwich and we <laughs> hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you so much, Dr. White. All right. Thank you. Everyone who attended, thank you so much. Have a good evening.